<laughs> um, welcome again. This is our 11th Destiny Talks. And for those of you who have been following us, you know that this is all about giving a platform to wonderful women like yourselves all across Malaysia to be able to share your stories. Because no matter how ordinary you feel you are, you actually have a wonderful story. Why am I so confident? Because you know the Lord, and the Lord is not with making us boring people. I know all of you have a wonderful story to share. In fact, I'll be so bold to say, hey, amongst you guys here, we got 106 now. If you think and you can be bold and courageous like Joshua and say, Grace, me, put me on. I got a wonderful story to share that will bless the socks out of the ladies in Malaysia. Ray, let me know. In fact, for your bravery, I'll give you something very special as well. So far, I've had to chase ladies down and beg them to come. Not all, but, <laughs> but I really, really would like ordinary ladies with extraordinary stories. And I know all of you have it to come forward. This is the platform for it. How the Lord led you to where you are at and to give glory to God. All right, so with that, let's prepare our hearts. I have two beautiful young girls, Emerald and Sabrina, to lead us into a wonderful time of worship. Today, it's, uh, you know, with, because our speaker is the youngest we've ever hosted so far, I really, really am hoping that many of you young ladies, younger ladies, okay, younger is defined by whatever age you want to define, okay? I put myself in that category tonight. All the younger ladies, this is for you tonight. So Emerald, Sabrina, take it away, lead us to a wonderful time of worship. Thank you Let's so much. Let's open our hearts. Um, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Emerald, and this is my sister, Sabrina. Hi. Um, thank you so much for joining us today and um, even as we um, prepare our hearts for a time of worship, I truly pray that the Holy Spirit would come and touch you wherever you are um, and join us in this time where we welcome the King of Kings wherever we are. Thank you. Alright. How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who sent me free. Hallelujah. Death 
death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Let's just lift our voice right now, Lord, to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Lord, you are Lord, wonderful, God. Thank you, Lord, Jesus. And we want to give you all the glory Jesus. and honor to you. Hallelujah. Thank, Thank you, Lord. Lord. Thank you, Lord. You're Holy God. Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise your name. Amen. Praise your name, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We welcome you, Lord. We welcome you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. You're my living hope. In the morning. Let's seal the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that seal the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me jesus yours it's a victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ. My living hope, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Indeed, Lord, you are our living hope, Lord Jesus. And we just give you all the glory and all the honor yes, that Lord. you deserve, Lord Jesus. We welcome you, Lord Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that you bless this session that your words speak, Lord Jesus, that you open our hearts, you open our ears, Lord Jesus, you open our minds, Lord, and you let us receive whatever message that you, has, you have prepared for mm. us, Lord Jesus. We dedicate this time to you, Lord, knowing yes, and Lord. trusting, Lord, that you will in this, you, indeed use this, Lord, mm. for your blessings, Lord Jesus, to flow, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for this amazing opportunity that we have today. Bless us even as we tune in to tonight's speaker. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Sabrina and Emerald. That was so wonderful. Sometimes we don't need all the instruments, isn't it? All we need is that voice of devotion to the Lord. And you really let us, at least I really felt the Lord's presence. Well, today we... You are still the youngest speaker we have, so uh, thank you very much. 
Um, Heidi is a human rights activist. And as you listen to her, what amazes me about her is that at her young age, she formed uh, an organization, Refuge for the Refugees, uh, which is to advocate the rights of refugees in Malaysia. And I'm sure tonight, hopefully, as she shares, we catch also a glimpse of the plight of uh, wonderful people in our land, but are stateless and have left their homes. Um, she does a lot of policy and advocacy work with governments and international bodies. I think to the extent that she was honored uh, with two notable awards. Uh, she met Queen Elizabeth II, the Young Leaders Award and the Southeast Asia Women of the Future Award. Um, what amazes me is that she is really balancing her life with many responsibilities. She runs um, 35 refugee schools, two shelter homes, a social business school. Um, she's also an associate professor at Taylor's Lakeside University, a supervisor to a PhD candidate in Australia, Catholic University. Um, if you are curious about how she get to do that, you can ask her at this young age, she su supervises a PhD candidate. And she also takes on uh, a lot of complex case management, especially in uh, human trafficking. I, I'm very confident that you will be blessed out of your socks, but more importantly also, what got her to this point? Uh, to be doing such meaningful work, many of which say, wow, how did she get there? Hi, Heidi, how are you? Hello, I'm doing well, thank you. Thank you for yeah. just, I, I know you're super busy. Um, thank how you was your day? Me. How was your day? Maybe tell um, us how your day was. Yeah, it was... It was pretty interesting. I think we um, just had a couple of back-to-back -back meetings in the midst of tying up um, pretty major um, partnerships with a few corporates that would hopefully um, see big shifts happen, um, see, you know, refugees get access to tertiary education. We recently had a corporation come in saying that they're willing to sponsor scholarships for uni for refugee students to go into universities. Um, I'm still doing quite a fair bit of consultancy work. So um, a big part of my day was spent in meetings, um, planning, um, you know, diversity and inclusion sessions for a few banks um, that I'm doing training in. So it's been a pretty good day. Um, a, bit, a bit of a relief because the past two weeks has been really busy. Um, I had classes every single night. I just, I'm doing a certification um, with the International Institute of Humanitarian Law in Italy. Um, I was sponsored by the UN here to do that, um, just to get further certified in protection work. So I've just finished um, my course. And so today has been a bit of a freer day, which is nice. Um, yeah. Hooray. Wow. You yeah. call that a freer day. <laughs> <laughs> I feel just, you know, every time I talk to you, I feel tired just talking to you because <laughs> you're running like uh, 10 times faster than my speed. Um, no, you're only young once. Yeah. So you have a wonderful story uh, prepared for us today. You said that yeah. the Lord, you know, kind of guided you along a certain line. So yeah. feel free to go ahead and uh, share it with us now. Yeah. Let me just figure out how to do this. Am I? Yeah. I'm so sorry. Yep. I am sharing my screen, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm so sorry. Let me just... Okay, sorry guys. I, I'm actually really technology... I, I'm really challenged um, in a whole technology way. So um, I hope... Okay, yes, I'm sharing my screen proper now. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I thought, you know, I'll... I was telling Grace today that, um, you know, I woke up, you know, I initially had prepared to do something completely different. Um, but I woke up today just really challenged, I guess, to um, just kind of dive deep and share about our journey, um, the past. So I am currently, Grace is right, I 
current, I'm currently 27 years old. I have been working with the refugee community since I was 17 since I was 17. I almost left, I almost stopped at seven. Obviously, sorry, I'm having like a, I'm having like a brain freeze moment. Yes, since I was 17 and not seven. <laughs> um, and I am a little bit more about me. I'm a first generation Christian. My parents are not believers. I came to faith at about 12, 13 years old, um, really by God's grace and, and really by coincidence. You know how we often speak about, you know, we've been handpicked by God. And I, and I think, you know, in, in an instance for me, it's been a lot of that because how I came to know Christ was actually at 11 years old, um, my parents, so um, I had a, a really good friend in school. Her name is Adele. These two girls are down, Erica. Um, they, their church, FJ, was having a children's camp. And so they decided to invite me to see if I was interested. And my parents just thought, you know, it was a good holiday opportunity. At that point, I was just really shy, really timid, um, you know, constantly had social anxiety, didn't know how to make new friends. And so my parents thought sending me to camp would be a good developmental experience. Um, and, and I think it also helped kind of free your hands a little bit because, you know, they had three kids all on school holidays. You know, how do you juggle so many kids on school holidays at one point of time, right? So it only made sense to ship one away um, for children's camp. And so my parents did that. Um, at camp, I think, despite knowing that it was a Christian camp, I didn't really know what being a Christian man, right? And a background of my family is that we are a very... Um, we're a Buddhist family, so we've got everything from, from the laughing Buddha at home, the big Chinese altar, um, you know, to a whole wall of Buddha statues. Uh, my parents still kind of like the joystick every day. Um, you know, during Vesak Day, they kind of make it a family tradition to go to the, to the temple. So we're very traditionally Buddhist that way. Um, and so I went to a children's Christian camp not knowing what to expect with the only intention that, you know, I'm here to have fun. I'm here to, to meet new friends. I'm here to kind of spend my school holiday. Um, and so every single time when the pastor was preaching, I would disengage, you know, I would kind of get into my own little wall. I'll take out my notepad and my pen and I start scribbling on my books, um, kind of just waiting for time to pass, right? Until it's time for games again. Um, and one day, I think when the pastor was preaching, I remember, um, I, I specifically remember that despite trying very hard to not pay attention, the pastor was preaching on um, the need to build our foundation um, on solid ground. Um, and, and yeah, so he was preaching about the need to build our foundation on solid ground um, just so that you know when the waves hit um, you know our roots remain strong you know um, and and yeah the importance of a strong solid foundation um, and as I was in my own little world suddenly I felt a shift in the hall um, it's weird I wasn't a believer but I think you know the Holy Spirit was really moving I I, I suddenly got goosebumps and um, I looked around the hall and just go like what is happening, right? And I and I turned to my friends and I saw a different ones standing up. And I asked them, like, hey, what's happening? Are they are they inviting newcomers to stand up? What are what are they doing, right? Um, was it like an icebreaker? Why why are different people standing up? You know, um, yeah. And and so my friends turned to me, despite knowing that I wasn't paying attention at all, they just went like, It's okay, Heidi, stand up, stand up anyway. I stood up and this very kind auntie brought me a bible and started praying for me and just went like welcome to the family of god and that was just really how i came to know christ right really not intentionally almost by accident but really the best so-called mistake i've done in that sense um and and me i think growing up the youngest of three and just being a typical super goody two shoes right despite it you know not being something that i sort of chose for myself um since I committed to it uh, and, and I was given a Bible, I I just, I think the fear of the Lord was so strong within me that I, I brought the Bible home and started reading the Bible every single day. Um, and I would lie down on the couch in my living room and read the Bible to my parents, only because my mother always taught me that the best way to, to memorize and to learn is to reading things out loud, right? And so, you know, if this could work for, you know, my, my school exams, it has to work for the Bible as well. Um, so that's really how my journey started. 
um, my parents were pretty, you know, they were pretty caught off guard at first, right? Because they didn't expect me to come to faith. Um, and, and they always thought it was a phase that would just pass eventually. Um, but God has been so good because um, I think at the time I was 11, 12 years old preparing for secondary school. My siblings, I'm the youngest, so my siblings were already in secondary school. And so when it came to um, going to secondary school and needing to choose, you know, co-curricular activities to join, um, my siblings told me to join the Christian Fellowship Group because apparently it was so big in the Mataraja that you can leave your blue card. And I, I know that there are many mothers here that's shaking your head. Um, but, you, you know, you can leave your blue card, your co-curriculum card to still get points and, 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 and go to, um, you know, just, just skip school, you know, and, and go to a nearby mall. You know, the nearest mall to us then was Acha Namantara Jaya, right? So I think I, I entered here really with that intention, you know, that I could kind of um, get my points that I needed, um, but I could skip, you know, sessions at the same time. But I remember the first time that I went for Christian Fellowship, right, I, I walked in and I felt the same goosebumps that I had once again, because God's presence was so real. And I think that's what that got me staying, you know. Um, and so since then, you know, my faith grew. Um, just so, I mean, I thought I would just share a bit of background about, you know, where I am in my faith um, and how I came to faith and the journey that it has been. Um, so... Now I'll show you with you a bit more about the work I do. So I'm like Grace so um, rightly mentioned, I am a human rights activist. Um, I run an organization called Refuge for the Refugees. It's a non-profit organization that seeks to raise awareness regarding the plight of refugees in Malaysia, as well as provide education for refugee children. Um, we've been around since 2012. Um, and today we run 35 schools, two halfway homes and a social business school. Um, you know, the only reason why we do this is because refugee kids in Malaysia don't have access to formal education. And so um, because of that, you know, they are stuck in a limbo and they're not able to go to school while they wait to be resettled. And this resettlement process can take anywhere between five to ten years often. Um, so I remember, I think right after secondary school, I was looking for an avenue to serve. And that's when I was introduced to the refugee community. Um, and that's really how the journey started for me. But um, I don't know, I woke up this morning, you know, about to share with you everything that we do at Refugee to Refugees, which, you know, I'm happy to bring you a quick, you know, a quick glimpse through later. Um, but I thought I'll just get a bit more personal with you guys. Um, exactly a year ago, um, exactly a year ago, I was, I mean, so being an activist and, and just really being, you know, obedient to what God has called us to, called me to, um, the journey has been extremely, extremely hard. It isn't just in running the schools and making sure that we've got sufficient funding to keep the schools going. Um, it is also standing so strong in my values and convictions that, um, that even when people come against us, um, we're still able to, to be confident that this is what the Lord has called us to do. The past year has been extremely hard. I don't even have the words for it. Exactly a year ago, actually, um, I, I sort of did a short expose on detention centers um, and the abuse that happens in detention centers in Malaysia only because we work with a lot of refugees and migrants that have been detained and they come back to us with harrowing stories of abuse um, and of mistreatment. Um, and, and exactly a year ago, I remember at 4.30 a.m. at night. Um, so when the pandemic started, I actually um, moved out of my family house for a couple of weeks only because things were so new and my parents were so old and I do want to risk, you know, we were out feeding about a, hundred, a thousand families on a weekly basis um, and, and I didn't want to risk, you know, bringing the virus home to my parents, especially given their age and, 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 and just their comorbidities 
And so I, I shifted out for a couple of months. And at 4 30 a.m. one night, I got a call from a lady that we rescued about two years ago. Um, it, it's crazy. I mean, even her story is a miracle in so many ways, right? Um, which I'll share with you later. But she called me because she couldn't sleep. She couldn't sleep because she had recurring nightmares of, of her experience in detention centers. She was back in the Philippines. And yet, um, despite being safe with her child, the PTSD was so real that, that she would just get nightmares upon on nightmares um, and she called me just bawling her eyes out you know not knowing how to just survive the night in that sense because the the desire to um to commit suicide at a point of time was so real so I remember just being on the phone with her and and, and talking to her through it um and after i got the phone i was i was so bothered by what was happening that i thought like you know what i needed to write about it i needed to write about it to raise awareness about what was happening and that's when i took things to social media um and the only reason why i did it was because at the same time um you know the mass arrest um, of refugees and migrants were happening I'm not sure if you guys kept up with the news last year, um, but as um, the, the lockdowns increased, um, our authorities were going in the numbers to arrest um, hundreds and thousands of refugees and migrants and putting them in detention centers. And this kind of just increased yeah, um, the chance of them, you know, getting COVID and then being infected by, by the disease. And it was also a very inhumane you know, um, way to respond at the point of time. So um, as an activist, I think I took, I took to um, social media and just my friends working news portals to share my thoughts on what was happening um, unexpectedly. Uh, I, I, so I do this, I mean, those who know me know that I kind of do this from time to time, right? Just write about my experiences and talk about it, hopefully to educate people about it. Um, then after sharing about the post, I went to sleep and I woke up the next day to my post being shared about um, 1.6 thousand times, I think. Um, and people were just talking about it, right? Because they didn't know that such things happened within detention centers. Um, with that, it was really powerful that people were having conversations and wanting to hold our governance accountable to abuse. Um, and this is especially important because if you guys are keeping up with, with the news today, um, within the past three months, we've had the fifth Malaysian die within custody, right? Um, and these are just Malaysians, you know, um, think about the number of migrants and, and, and refugees um, that, that this happened to. Um, and while, while it did raise a significant bit of awareness, um, there was a big backlash of cyberbullying you know people were coming into my inbox and going like you know uh china babi pengkhianat negara people were just pooing really bad um comments threatening me threatening my family um and 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 shortly after um the police kind of launched an investigation on me. Um, our immigration department launched an investigation um, on my allegations, um, you know, saying that I'm here to tarnish the country's good name and I'm here, you know, to misuse the internet when whatever that I was sharing was, was, was number one, the truth of what really happened on the ground. Second of all, it was backed up by data from, you know, our Human Rights Council, which is SOHACAM. So everything that I was sharing was already reported um, in SOHACAM reports. Um, but, but the fact that it was gaining so much traction, not just locally, but globally, um, got the investigation happening. Um, and remember at a point of time, you know, I was literally terrified for my life. I, um, a few weeks after that happened, the police actually came to my house in three police cars, um, to pick me up. Um, and I, when I wasn't home, um, they picked up my aunt in state who was in a, who was in the garden, um, just to hold her hostage while um while i turn up at a police station in case i don't turn up um and i guess one of the reasons why i'm sharing with you this is because i i don't i mean i mean i i don't know about you guys you know and how you would have navigated through all of that but for me it was one of the toughest seasons of, of my life it was it was it was um i remember at one point of time i think i was at a peak of just suffering I mean so the thing about doing work like that and being so much on the ground <clears throat> is that um the impact on your mental health is very real right because you deal with people who have encountered who are struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder you deal with um people who have experienced so much hardship in life and as people who care as someone who cares you kind of carry on that weight as well remember 
already really struggled with mental health, but until a comment came in, you know, someone basically just said, like, go hang yourself. I remember that almost pushed me so close to the edge. Um, I looked at it and I broke down and it hit me so hard because um, at a point of time, I mean, despite knowing that, you know, it wasn't the right Christian thing to do and all that, um, the struggle was very real. Um, and, and someone saying that almost kind of, it broke me in so many ways. Um, yeah, but I think... Sorry, this is, I mean, I really wasn't planning to share so much in that sense. But one reason to why I guess I felt led to share this um, with you guys today is um, to really encourage you that we need to, I mean, I, I feel that the pandemic has been such a revealing season to all of us. Um, it has been a season where... Um, we know we are taught to to do church differently, you know, to to reach out, to share the gospel differently. But more than anything, I think it's been a season where I don't know about you, but I've been challenged to ask myself how 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 much of my faith am I living out? You know, my faith in the work that I do, trusting that um, God will continue providing. Um, now we raise, um, we feed about a thousand families on a single week. And my main role is raising 60,000 ringgit every week. And um, the the stress is real, you know, how can I possibly raise 60,000 ringgit every single week for the past one and a half years? But God has been providing over and over and over again. Um, but not just, you know, thinking about how God has been providing. I, I think one thing that has truly impacted me is realizing how he has not just been providing, but he has truly, his protection has been so real, right? Really being in the midst of um, of, of being investigated. Uh, thankfully, I mean, so long story short, um, investigations has been closed. They couldn't find anything to really penalize me with. Um, it was just a scare tactic to stop me from speaking up. Um, but, but through it all, I think it was a reminder that God's protection is so real. Um, and so this pandemic has really got to me thinking, you know, how can we as a church, as, as a body of Christ, live our faith out? You know, we often preach it from the pulpit. We often, um, you know, our challenge to leave our faith out when we speak to other people. Um, but on our daily basis, how do we leave our faith out? And one of it, I think, one of the most powerful things that we can do is, is to think of how we can love the communities around us. Um, I remember when the pandemic first started, right? And, and Honestly, my biggest frustration, um, and I'm totally aware that, you know, I, I'm saying this in a room full of like a lot of Christian leaders and pastors and people working in full-time ministry, but, um, you know, as we shifted everything online and tried to increase engagement online, um, what I noticed, I mean, I say this as I serve in church, right? What I noticed was the people that we truly need to reach out to, the people that need to know Jesus, um, don't have access to, to online, to Zoom, don't have access access to online church services the people that need to know jesus in this pandemic are by the streets are being evicted are living in fear um you know and how are we how are we being jesus to them i think that has been my biggest challenge you know how do we do things how do we start living our faith in an unconventional way um how do we continue reaching out to them beyond our cell groups and our alpha sessions, you know, beyond our church online services? How do we reach out to people that truly need to know Jesus? Um, yeah, and and so I guess my encouragement would be, you know, as we go through yet another lockdown, as we go through yet another, um, you know, frightening season of, of having to stay home and keep safe and 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 social distance, you know, and, and be away from families. Um, what are we as Christians doing um, in such a time as this? How do we actively be aware of the needs around us? And it doesn't always need to be finances. I know that, you know, everywhere is tight financially, but I think that um, it's something as simple as reaching out to that one person at a time. Um, it's it's that's it's as simple as um, you know seeing how we can you know make connections within our communities to support each other through. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna also briefly share with you. You know what do we, you know what we have, what we do at Refugee Refugees. Um, we um, 
our focus is education, um, shelter, empowerment, advocacy, and case management. Um, and what I've been really impacted by is that so I'm going to tell you a story about, I'm not going to run you through everything we do because um, that you can read offline. Um, but you know how faith is so important in the work, you know, and um, two years ago, I took on a human trafficking case where um, a migrant lady who had given birth. Um, so the backstory to all of this is that a lot of times it's difficult for refugees and migrants to give um, to go to government hospitals to give birth. Um, and this is because um, they often get stopped and arrested by authorities or have their babies taken away from them um, upon childbirth, you know, only to be thrown in detention centers. Um, what happened was this lady, because of all of this, she ended up going to a really shady clinic in KL um, to give birth, only once again to have a baby taken away from her against her will to be sold to syndicates for a lot of money. Um, do you guys know that they, Malaysia is one of the top five countries for baby selling um, in the entire world? Babies get sold for anywhere between 150,000 ringgit to 180,000 ringgit. Um, if, if you are a basic Malaysian like me, I'm pure Chinese, I'm considered cheap and I go for 100,000 ringgit. So everything, if, if you are mixed race, you go for a slightly higher price. Um, if you're a female, you're a lot more expensive because you can be used in a sex industry. Um, globally, female children as young as two years old get introduced to the sex industry. Um, and it's a big industry that is very in demand. Um, and everything plays a role, right? Your features, your skin color. So babies that are mixed race are always more in high demand. If you're a mixed race and you're female, you go for a really high price. Um, so this lady went to the clinic to give birth. Um, her baby was taken away from her, from her against her will. Um, and, and long story short, you know, uh, we, the, the syndicates that came after her child also came after her just so that they could get her to sign off on final documents. Um, and a lot of these syndicates often involves um, people in power, right? And so after the syndicate, you know, tracked her down, we had to rescue her and place her in a safe home um, while we wait for, um, while we found ways to reunite her baby and her child. And this includes, you know, making police reports, hunting down the syndicates, making connections. Um, and I've dealt with quite a number of cases like that. It's very, it's, it's highly stressful because this means that um, I am in direct contact with syndicates. Um, and, and, you know, that's why I don't talk a lot about my family, um, only to keep my family safe um, because of the work that I do. Um, when, when I remember one of the days, you know, I was in the shelter home and I was sitting with her and speaking to her and trying to drop a case um, just to get our ducks in a row before going to the authorities. Um, she looked at me and she, and at that time, you know, she, 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 was, still, uh, she was still a Muslim. Um, she was a Filipino lady that was a Muslim because she, her boyfriend was a Pakistani guy. Um, and I remember we placed her in a shelter. Um, the only shelter that made themselves available um, was a shelter um, for the transgender community. So um, it was really powerful because a lot of, I mean, they were all, they all looked like women, but they weren't all women. Um, and so, you know, having just given birth and experiencing so much changes in her body, she went to them, you know, and she tried to get advice, um, you know, um, on, on just the changes of her body that was happening. And, and they were all really kind and really sympathetic to her, but they couldn't give accurate advice, right? Because they have not gone through um, the same changes in her body. Um, and so I decided to, to bring in two friends from church who are mothers um, to give her advice. Um, and I remember... You know, it was just something as simple as bringing in people who cared and people who loved and people who showed up for you. Um, I remember after my friends left, you know, she turned to me and she she said, you know, Ma'am Heidi, those are such good people. Who are they and where are they from? You know, and that's when I could tell them that tell her that like, you know what, they're from church, you know. Um, and 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 from our conversations, you know, she started asking about church and the faith, and she eventually came to know Christ. 
which really praise God for that. Um, two days into coming to know Christ, uh, I, was, I was in a home with her once again, you know, sitting with her, walking through the case. Um, and she turned to me and she said, you know, Ma'am Heidi, I prayed yesterday um, and God gave me a vision that, um, God gave me a vision that my baby and I will be re reunited in two weeks. And I looked at her and I just went like, you know, is it a vision that God gave you or is it a timeline that, you know, you've set for yourself, right? Because when I prayed, obviously, like, I, I, like, I did not get the same timeline. Um, and, and she said, like, no, no, ma'am, Hadi, I really prayed. Um, and so I think her faith, um, so, you know, every day that when we met, we would, we would pray together and she'd always tell me the same thing, you know, she and her baby would be reunited in two weeks. Um, true enough, by the grace of God, um, we managed to track down the syndicates and rescue her baby within two weeks. I've dealt with easily 25 different cases and it takes at least three months. That's why when she told me two weeks, I told her that's impossible, you know. Um, but I think after that encounter, it made me realize and ask myself, what timelines am I setting for God? Um, am I, you know, do I trust him enough to be obedient and to just work according, you know, to give my best each day and trust that he would show up? Or am I unknowingly setting timelines for him to move in my head, if that makes sense? Because so often we're, we're like that, you know, we go like, oh yeah, God can move, but he needs five months. You know, God can move, but he needs three months. Um, and, and unknowingly, I find myself putting God in a box again and again. But that encounter has truly challenged me to to take each new case on with um, new lens and new perspective and, and just that that trust, you know, that, that God will move. Um, and ever since then, um, the work has just grown in bits and bounds, right? Once I got to taking that new perspective with me, you know, to, to, to really learn to surrender all that God has called us to do um, and to trust, you know, in his perfect timing. And, and, I mean, I say this because we so often talk about trusting in God's perfect timing, right? Trusting that God will open the doors, trusting that God will lead us where he needs to, to, to where he needs us to go. Um, but how often do we truly believe that, you know, and truly understand that? Um, and, and so that's the encouragement that, you know, I would, I would really leave with us, you know, um, as we navigate yet through another pandemic, you know, that is just truly ripping the nation apart. I mean, we might not entirely feel it as bad because we are considered privileged in so many ways, right? But what are we doing? Um, how are we shining God's light and God's love on the communities around us? Because the time is now, you know, people are hungry for Jesus. Um, the communities that we serve, they're hungry for Jesus. They want, yeah, they're hungry to experience God, you know? Um, and through my work, I think I really realized that I've met so many within the refugee community, um, people from, from Pakistan and Afghanistan, you know, predominantly Muslim countries that have become refugees because of the faith that they choose, because they chose to believe in Jesus. And that has truly challenged my faith in so many ways, right? If, if they can choose to flee, if they can choose Christ, and be persecuted over and over and over and over again, and still choose Christ once again, and to live out your faith, what are we doing, you know, um, with the faith that we have, you know, and our freedom, I know it's limited, but our freedom to express our faith, right? Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I feel that like I am probably just kind of rambling a lot, um, but yeah, I think this has really this is something that God has really placed on my heart um, this season, and and I think you know the last thing I really like to share is as I prayed for a word for us, um, and I as I, I was praying for a word for us, I think the word endurance came up, um, you know, in this yeah in this season I I pray for a greater endurance for us. Um, I'm just gonna pull something up real quick. Um, yeah, so I, I actually had an entire thing written down, but yes, I pray for greater endurance for us this season. Endurance in not just, you know, a lot of times when I think about endurance, I think about dread and just like, 
very sian, like I need to endure something. But I think God has just been challenging me to, to, to shift my perspective and to, when I think about endurance, to wait in anticipation, in, in joy, in trusting that God is about to do something. Um, and I think the posture in our season of waiting is really key and important um, in, in, in really setting us up for what God wants us to do the next season. Um, yeah, I think I'm just, that, that has really been um, what's on my heart. I'm so sorry if, you know, today I was just a bit scattered. I'm not usually this scattered, but um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions um, that you guys have yeah. or might have. Yeah. Wonderful. I, I don't think you were scattered. You, to me, you were very coherent. <laughs> and I, I'll tell you, Heidi, I was so carried along with what you were sharing. Um, to be honest, I, I'm still stuck with the two-year-olds being trafficked for sex and, you know, to live a life uh, as, you know, being used forever. I mean, it's so inconceivable. I just kind of, I can't even move from there in my heart. Um, I mean, I have two grandchildren and I was like, wow, you know, it's just, how can people be so evil yeah 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 um but thank you so much because i think you've really uh brought to the surface as you said an awareness that many amongst us to be honest we are so sheltered in our walls of the church and our families in our middle class christians majority yeah. of us we don't know this life that you are describing that's so real in Malaysia. Yeah. And so I'm really, I want to thank you for just bringing that to us. I mean, sometimes we read about it here and there, but it's like distant. It's like somebody yeah. else's life. So thank you so much for that. Um, I think we are getting quite a lot of questions. Um, so let me start with, because you, you actually were, uh, asking like into the air and it's almost like asking us and I think some people picked up on it in terms of really what can church do because you know there is um, a lot of questioning about what church really is especially these two years when we are locked down and yeah. you know what is church meant to be yeah. so I was wondering if you yourselves having asked it maybe ahead of many of us yeah what do you think church yeah. should do um thank you so much for the question i think i mean you know as i was praying at one point of time you know when the mass evictions for refugees and migrants were happening and um you know as we we're going on the ground and delivering food aid we realized that you know, one, I mean, like a couple of days ago, a refugee can have written in and just given this address to us. But by the time we actually get aid to them, which is just a few days after, they would have been kicked out of their homes, you know, and living on the streets. Um, at that point of time, I think, you know, I was just thinking how powerful it would be if in such a time as this, when we can't use church, and I know there's probably like, you know, different regulations and laws around it that we need to further look into, right? Um, but at this point of time, when we can't use church to meet physically, what if we turn it around into um, shelters or safe hubs, you know, or lighthouses um, where people who are struggling can come by and, and receive help? It doesn't need to be big help, you know, it can be just a bag of rice, you know, a tray of eggs. Um, but it'd be so powerful if we've got these lighthouses that are set up across our nation, right, where people can go to your nearest church and pick up a bag of rice or a tray of eggs. You know, to us, it's just that. But to the community, um, it goes a really long way. You know, a lot of them, you know, during lockdowns, go three, four days without eating, you know. And for those that have been kept in their homes, you know, can we can we house, you know, just, it doesn't need to be 100 people, but can we house just the 10 people, um, you know, church premises, you know, until they find a bit more stability? Um, what can we, how can we meet these people, people in such a practical way, right? Um, using the resources that we already have, the church building that we already have, you know. Because um, lockdown or not, we are already paying for such resources right 
how can we turn our churches into lighthouses for the communities who are struggling? I think that would be a really powerful way. Um, you know, just moving forward, I guess, to answer your question as well. Um, you know, if, if a church is looking into supporting a community, I always emphasize wherever I go on the importance of focusing on one community and building a long-term relationship with them. Um, and this is because, you know, um, I mean, I work across churches and across just groups of college students. Um, and it's usually only during Christmas um, where we get a high influx of, you know, people coming by and wanting to do nice things for the kids. Um, and I always thought it was, you know, just nice and harmless until one day this my one of my students just just looked at me and go you know teacher we feel like a museum people come by and touch our things and take pictures of us um but we never see them again um and i think that just broke my heart right because um i mean i myself have been part of so many missions groups that actually do that right we go into the community uh once a year but I think it's really powerful to do long-term engagement if we were to work with a community. Um, and, and, you know, let's not spread ourselves too thin. Let's, let's you know, choose to adopt one community and build a long-term relationship with them only because, um, you know, that's where, you know, with a long-term relationship, that's where we can do a lot more in the long run. Um, I hope that, I hope that I answered that question. What can church do in such a time as this? Set up, um, you know, see if we can turn our churches into lighthouses. Um, but also, let's see how we can support the smaller groups around us. Yeah, wonderful. I think it does take um, a massive mindset change in the in the pastoral team and eldership team for all of that to happen, plus members as well. Yeah. Uh, but you have yeah. certainly sowed the seed and uh, you put a challenge on yeah. the table, so to speak. Yeah. And I believe that anyone yeah. who really wants to make a difference yeah. has got to start thinking along that way. Yeah, Honestly, I feel that that is, I mean, in such a time as this, that is the most powerful way to reach people for Christ. Um, people are no longer interested in, in, I mean, those that are desperate for Jesus are no longer interested in cell groups or, you know, online church services. Um, they don't have access to, to, to these sessions that we do online. Um, we're circulating, I feel that we're circulating around the same people over and over again. I mean, I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not saying that what we do as a church is useless. I mean, like, oh, not at all, right? <laughs> but I'm, I'm saying that like, hey, um, let's be realistic, right? Those that need to know Jesus, you know, what access do they have to the church at this point of time? Yeah. Yeah. We, we have some questions around yeah. having heard you and the fact that you have to raise like 60K every week. Wow, that's massive. Um, for those among us here who really wants to help, wants to be involved, do you have some uh links or something that they can perhaps yeah. uh go to and volunteer themselves or even yeah. support in whatever way shape form yeah um if it's okay can i um piece together something a bit more comprehensive and and send it over to you and you can see if you can i mean if you want to just or i can post it on a facebook group um yeah Sure. We, yeah, I mean, for us, the usual, I mean, giving makes a huge difference, though I totally understand that, you know, there are limitations and, and, and it's a hard time for everyone. Um, volunteers at this point of time, given, you know, how bad the pandemic is, is always a bit harder um, because we try to limit movements on the ground. And, um, you know, we have to go through a really tedious process each and every time we register a new volunteer. Um, you need to get like a police letter for them and, you know, for them to be approved by, you know, so it's always a big, a big challenge bringing in new volunteers on the ground at this point of time. Um, but, you know, for example, a year ago, uh, when we needed to do an emergency collection or we did a venue to pack because we don't have our own office, right? Or, or the office that we have is, is a tiny shop lot, you know? A church actually opened up their, their venue for us to pack our weekly groceries and that made a huge difference you know um and then a few weeks later when we needed to do a collection for um pre-loved clothes and sanitary pads for prisons and detention centers another church came by and go like hey um we can we can open up a location and we can schedule volunteers throughout the weekend um on a 
like a two hour shift basis um, to just be on the receiving end. And I think that was also really powerful um, because, you know, that really eased the load for us, right? Collection points and, and just supporting us with existing resources like venues. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. I have a question here on, the, I guess, more personal now for a little while. Yeah. Um, given the enormous mental load on you and also yeah. physical, yeah. Um, how, how do you carry this load? I mean, you, you did yeah. say you were at the brink of a cliff yeah. at one point, yeah. but uh, what pulled you back? I mean, what were some of the handles that helps you? Yeah. Um, what would be... I, so I actually go for therapy. Um, I have been seeing a clinical psychologist for the past three years, um, past two years maybe. Um, and that has made a huge difference to me. And I think, and I say this, um, I feel, and I say this because um, my process of, of even, you know, getting to seek professional help was a very hard one, especially because, you know, there's a big stigma around it in the whole Asian culture, but also in churches, right? I remember, you know, at one point going to my um, pastors and leaders about it. And, and to them, they keep saying that, like, seek help internally within the church, you know, speak to your pastors, speak to your leaders, um, let's pray about it, you know. And I think when I wasn't getting better, um, the challenge was also, you know, me having to question, like, do I not have enough faith? Um, and honestly, that broke me because I felt I felt like a terrible Christian for struggling with my mental health. And I feel that we need to start normalizing, um, you know, speaking about mental health in churches, especially in the pandemic when so many people are struggling. Um, you know, the church and, 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 and prayer and faith is powerful, but um, professionals exist also for a reason. Um, yeah, so I, I, see, I go for therapy um, on a weekly basis. Um, it started, I think, two years ago when I took on a really hard case and um, I was physically assaulted by Sydney kids that, that I was investigating. Um, and that left me really, really traumatized and um, pretty badly beaten up and shaken up as well. Um, yeah, so that, that, that has been key for me. Um, another thing is also just having, for me, I'm really thankful to have a really close um, prayer circle that I, that, I, um, that I go to and people that I can um, go to and just be real with. So people that I can go to for prayer, but also just to be real with. Um, and, and I say this only because, you know, sometimes we feel with our Christian circles, we need to, um, we need to, Kind of have a very positive front and um and and i think the prayer circle that i have um has been a really powerful safe space for me to ask all these big questions about faith i'm still very much a christian i'm still i mean i am a hundred percent drawn to my faith right but i think sometimes you just need safe spaces to ask these big questions about faith when the going gets tough you know and sometimes you know we don't always have the avenue in church to ask these questions, you know, and you don't know whether it's kind of appropriate to ask these questions without people being worried that like you're sliding away from your faith. Um, for me, this prayer circle to, to have um, to, to have this safe space to ask these, these big questions, but to also pray for and with me and for me to go back, you know, for that covering at the end of the day makes a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for, yeah. for highlighting that. It's true. It's a, there's a stigma around seeing professionals and therapies and yeah. and I am one for one thing to make it more transparent because yeah. we all have those days you know where we yeah. really need some maybe help of some sort yeah. and uh, yeah any everyone here don't be ashamed because we really yeah. do need help we get help and there yeah. are some very good experts in in, yeah. uh, in our land that can help us yeah um so I, I get a question here. I guess Jolene has been asking a few questions. She was our previous speaker from Malaysian Care. But this issue on fear of authorities coming, you know, you have been haggled and, uh, you know. Um, and I think in Malaysia, there is an overhanging shadow of fear when yeah. it comes to even wanting to do good, you know. Yeah. So what would you do or say to 
those sincere folks amongst us who really want to help, but have this yeah. Yeah, yeah. fear because we really don't know what to do if they come and yeah. harass us, you know. Yeah. So I think first of all, um, practical steps is to always have a lawyer on standby. Um, you don't need to hire a lawyer within your congregation. I'm sure that there are lawyers set up a ministry to have lawyers sign up, you know, just to kind of be on your back and call if and when something happens. I think that has been um, one of the key lessons I've learned to always have a lawyer on standby. Um, but more than that, I feel that um, this might not always, this might not exactly answer your question, but I feel that the fear is always real. But as long as you know that you're doing the right thing, um, honestly, the, the authorities cannot do much. They might try to scare you into going quiet or into submission. Um, but as long as you're doing the right thing and, and, and really serving the people um, and, and meeting the needs, uh, there will be people that will have your back um, if something bad were truly to happen. You know, um, so I always say that, I mean, fear is very real. I mean, and, and I totally acknowledge it because I ever since, I mean, before, before last year, I was fearless, you know, I, um, you know, when they talk about childlike faith and just really going out, that's what I did, right? But last year's incident broke me and, and <laughs> terrified me to the point that sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes when I hear a car pulling out of my house, it can just be delivery, but I get like waves of panic attacks, right? Cause I go like, did I do something wrong again, you know? Or if I see like the police outside now, I just get a bit more scared. Um, but I feel that, you know, you cannot allow yourself to be limited by these fears. Um, as long as you, as long as your conviction is clear and you know why you're doing this, go for it. Um, and if and when something happens, uh, what I've really been inspired by is that our networks um, especially within the faith is so big that if you run into trouble, I'm sure, you know, you'll find lawyers to bail you out. So um, that is my best advice. Be grounded and convicted in what you need to do um, and have lawyers on standby, you know, in case something happens. Chances mm -hmm. are things won't happen. Yeah. And, and when you just shared that reminded me, my husband, you know, once was intimidated by a situation. It almost felt spiritual on him. He kept peeping out of the window and, you know, wondering if people were out to catch him. Yeah. But it was spiritual, you know. So yeah. I'm glad that you have a prayer group, Heidi, yeah. because it is spiritual. Sometimes when it gets a grip on us, it does yeah. need prayer help as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of having a prayer group. Um, um, and that's where the church exists, right? To support one another through. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of times things can be very spiritual, especially if you're out there trying to do what is right um, and, and God is just using you in different ways. Um, the attack of the enemy can be very real. So have a prayer group. Yeah. So uh, our two uh, lovely worship <laughs> ladies want to know, how did you know this was your calling? Did you just stumble or you knew? How did you know that this was something you God had wanted you to do? Mm, I think, okay. I think I, for me, honestly, I stumbled upon it, right? Um, I was looking for somewhere to serve um, after my high school ended and I came across the refugee community. But I think when I was I think as I was serving the community, it was just this peace that I had, um, this peace that surpassed all understanding, you know, and just learning, I guess, learning to walk in obedience and seeing God open doors, um, really big doors, you know, for us to do, you know, policy work or consultation work, working with governments. Um, I think with that peace and that, that, that leading um, helped me understand that, you know what, this is what God has called me to do. Um, I don't think, I mean, I don't think, you know, for sometimes people tell you that like, oh, you woke up one day and, and, and you just hear a voice, you know, telling you to work with refugees. Um, I mean, I think that's amazing when that happens, but a lot of times it is going where God has led you and remaining obedient to that journey and, and trusting, you know, for God to continue opening doors. Um, and that's when you know that like God is, God is there. Um, I know this because so many times I wanted to give up, 
um, uh, so many times I was extremely burnt out and uh, a lot more offers came my way. That was a lot more enticing, um, you know, corporate jobs and international offers. Um, but the fact that I had no peace to take on those offers uh, was a reminder to me that this is what God has called me to do, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, God is, I always say God is very clever. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. leads us to our calling. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, I just realized that, uh, you know, time is really running. Yeah. So I would love for anyone who still have some burning questions to uh, go ahead and type it in. Um, but I do want to ask uh, at least kind of, and I, I will want Nisam, one of our Women Commission members, to pray for you in a moment as well, Nisam. So uh, be prepared yeah. for that. But I, I had this curious thing about, you know, you met Queen Elizabeth II. And I was just curious, did you, what did she say to you? Did she say anything of significance? Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> we are all a bit royalist, a bit some of us here, you know. Um. No, she asked me, so at that point of time, I had just set up our schools in Myanmar. And so I think when I walked up to her and I received, she just went like, well done. Um, and she also go like, I recently, I heard that you recently set up your schools in Myanmar. Can you tell me more about it? Um, so yeah, she, I remember just being really mind blown by her incredible memory because she, she was about 93, 94 years old at that point of time. And I'm like, wow. You know, among so many of us, you can remember that I had, it was me that established schools in Myanmar. Um, okay. Yeah, so that was really the basis of our conversation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, this, this one I always like to ask, but uh, you being so young and so on, yeah. uh, so I won't get a teenager to stand in front of you. I'll, I'll prefer you to look forward into like 10, 20, 10 years from now. Yeah. Uh, do you see yourself in the same line? How, how do you think this whole thing will evolve? I mean, it is a little bit of crystal ball, but uh, yeah. it's just useful for young people sometimes to see because everyone seems to plan five yeah. years, 10 years nowadays. Yeah. No, yeah, I hear you. Um, I wish I had an, I think if you asked me this two years ago, I would have a brilliant answer planned <laughs> out for you. Um, but because I am very much of a planner, um, but I think that I've been challenged recently by the Lord to just be consistent in what I do, right? Um, so I not really think about a five-year plan or 10-year plan, but to just be consistent with my every day. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen 10 years on the road. I mean, I would like to tell you that I am still doing this. Um, that would be ideal, but I don't know where God leads, right? So um, my plan, my five-year, 10-year plan is to just remain consistent in the work and in, um, you know, just this journey of obedience. It's, it's hard, um, this journey of obedience. I, um, I used to think, you know, when I was a newer Christian that I just had to learn obedience once and it will stick with me. But it's a daily choice, right, to wake up and to be obedient to what the Lord has called you to. And so I think that's my focus, you know, to learn to be consistent and obedient um, every day. Mm. Wonderful. Oops, there is a last question that popped in. This will be really the last one. Um, oh, it's similar. Uh, Amy, I think she just answered it. <laughs> yeah, Sabrina how do you know Emerald. that? Yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, can I have these some, uh, Heidi, you know, I, I feel that all of us here, now we are running at 112 people, you included, really need to say, we will commit to praying for you and the work that you do. Because one of my takeaways that I really need to add you to my prayer, uh, you know, and uh, because what you do is uh, is amazing, for lack of a better word, and uh, you do need a lot of covering. So Nisam, can you yeah. please pray for Heidi on our behalf? Sure. Yes, Heidi. Praise God. Let's pray. 
Lord, we want to thank you and bless you as we are so amazed how you handpicked Heidi Kwa to become your instrument. We can see your hand on her, Lord, as she be, has been moving. Lord, we want to thank you for her. We bless you, Lord, and we pray that your presence will continue to be upon her. Anoint her, Lord, with a double portion of your Holy Spirit. And every step that she takes, may your presence go with her. Cover her with your blood. And Lord, at times when she is discouraged, you will be the one to encourage her. At times when she wants to give up, you are the one who has done it. And how, Lord God, you have motivated her. Please continue, Lord, to motivate her. Lord, we thank you for her heart for the refugees, the people very close to your heart. We pray, Lord, that this passion for these people will continue to grow. And she will be able, Lord God, to be an example to many, many young Malaysians that they will also, Lord, become the caring people you want us to be. We pray, Lord, that you will use Heidi to be an inspiration to many, many Christians in Malaysia as well as around the world. We thank you for all the awards she has. We pray, Lord, that she will continue to be humble and continue, Lord, to serve you in a wonderful way. And today, even, Lord, as uh, Grace interviewed her, as she shared with us, we know, Lord, you have really inspired us, motivated us. We pray that your blessings will rest upon all of us and then especially upon Heidi Kwa, that she will continue to be your instrument. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I, uh, I, I think everyone would agree with me that we have been uh, so stretched. <laughs> I almost feel my heart like also going to break on some points when you hear hearing some of the stories that you tell. Yes. Um, and for those of you who have asked about, you know, how you can help and so on, as Heidi said, she will uh, type up some information. And uh, if you had, obviously you have registered, we have your email and contact, we will send it to you. Uh, through email or WhatsApp. Uh, and we might also post it up in the NECF Facebook, uh, NECF Women Commission Facebook page. If you are not yet a member of the NECF Women Commission, you go to your Facebook, there's a search button, you type NECF Women Commission, and it will pop up. You request to be a member, and there will be three questions you must answer. For those of you who did not or refused to answer those three questions, it will hang in limbo land for about a month or two, and then we will decline you. Because we need you to answer those three questions. It's very simple, you don't, it's not a test. When I was... um, so for those of you who say, how come I'm not accepted? It's because you did not answer question. <laughs> But if you would just answer those three questions, it's a simple approve, go through. And once you are in there, you have access to, uh, sorry. Once you are in there, you have access to uh, past Destiny Talks, the conference we had in 2020, devotionals, articles, and other sharings that comes up. Uh, plus, uh, information like what we will post from uh, Heidi as well. Um, and I, I encourage everyone, sometimes when we listen, uh, it's just, we move on to something else. But for tonight's, I hope you'll take it home. You'll actually let it percolate through your system and really pray and ask the Lord, God, what can I do to be part of the solution for people that are so pressed and unsettled in our own land? I think the Lord would be well pleased if we would ask ourselves these questions. Um, so with that, um, we are no longer taking photos because <laughs> we got many of that. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Heidi, do you have, I wanted to ask you one last, what's your favorite verse in the Bible? Um, 
I think it's Micah four six. Um, what does God love, require of you? Yeah, but to love, um, to walk humbly, and to, um, yeah, to fight for justice. I think that has been one of my most favorite verses that I turn to. Okay, wonderful. Um, so this is um, the the reason I ask is um, sometimes the Bible verse that. For example, that is motivating you in our prayer to look at that, and it might likewise uh, quicken in our spirit as well. So, very well. Uh, good night, everyone. So, you can unmute and begin to shout across each other. It's okay to make noise now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.